Okay. Greetings, 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 and uh, welcome to Heal Talk Tuesdays with Lisa. This is so good. It's so good to be here with you. It's so good to be right here amongst all of you. And thank you for being present. Thank you for showing up. Um, this is amazing. I came on and my guest was not showing up to talk about difficulties and everything. You know what? We're all therapists, we can handle this, we can handle stress, we can handle so much more in life, right? Right. So I'd like to introduce you. I am so honored, I am so excited to have my guest, Sharon Waxkirsch, um, be on Heal Talk, Real Talk. So for all of you who are here, um, Come on, this is a treat. You're going to be treated to such an amazing, uh, amazing session. With that, allow me to take a moment and I was, I want to introduce you to my guest. Sharon is a master clinical hypnotherapist and had the privilege of studying with not only our master uh, Gil Boyne, who has now passed away, may God bless his soul, but Dr. John Butler, and who is a renowned hypnotherapist of his own in England. He is very much in the UK and through training medical and dental professionals. And their courses were accelerated and accredited by the Royal College of Surgeons in the UK. And that's not easy. So with encouragement with Dr. Butler, Sharon continued to work in the dental arena and becoming very well known in the dental schools, universities, and private companies. So Sharon is someone who is like, you know how we have the dog whisperer, Instead of the dog whisperer, I like to call Sharon the whisperer of becoming like she becomes the anesthesia. And you want to know about what is the powers of hypnosis? Well, stay tuned. Welcome, Sharon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, thanks for everybody, all your wonderful people out there that have taken some time to watch, you know, watch your um, live pro programs. They're fantastic. I enjoy them myself. But thanks to everybody for being patient for technical issues <laughs> in this end. It's all good. It's all good. So someone is messaging and saying, where is the Zoom? Um, I thought we are very much live. It seems like we're live on Facebook. It does say so. So um, um, I can't see any uh, anyone if they can see me or not. Okay, let's can't see us. All right, let's just continue on. Uh, I think we are very much live, and uh, let's continue. So Sharon. Please share about your work. I know you are in Indiana right now and you have your own school of hypnotherapy. By all means, please take it from here and introduce yourself in a more perfect. Go ahead and introduce yourself. I was looking over there and they're saying we're live, we're good. So oh, good, good, go. wonderful, wonderful. Yes. I'm pleased, I'm delighted. Well, I'm surrounded by boxes here. I'm in a, I am in Purdue uh, University in my husband's office. This is what a, a, a science professor's office looks like. It's very typical <laughs> as one might imagine. So, um, and he's in the uh, virology department. So it's a bit chaotic as you can imagine at this point in time. Um, we came back to Indiana for a break. So we're doing sabbatical over in California where we've been for the last half year. So normally I'm based in um, Indiana, uh, West Lafayette. 
and uh, and England. Uh, you can hear from my accent. I'm a Londoner. So uh, a in, Londoner. I, I'm a Londoner um, <laughs> through and through. Um, so I have a training school um, that was accredited by the uh, ACHE, the American Council of Hypnotist Examiners, which was uh, which, uh, as some of you know, was begun by Gil Boyne. And um, it's a fantastic professional body. It's it's absolutely second to none. Um, and I've been accredited as the only school by the ACHE in the Midwest. Um, and actually now, because of COVID, I'm online. So I have an online Aren't training. All? I do now have my training has now gone online. And interestingly enough, many of the students are coming from London. So, mm. <laughs> so I'm still working with London clients and London um, students and uh, various students or already hypnotherapists that have trained here, I now, I now supervise for them. So wonderful. Well, we did meet at one of our conferences so many years ago. And since then, I have followed you. And unfortunately, our conference did not happen this year due, due to COVID, or else we would have done this live together right here. Absolutely. And, and don't I just love California. So <laughs> can't wait to come back. All those that haven't been to the ACHE conference do go. It's lovely. I mean, you just meet such lovely people. I've made some of the best connections there already in you know, just, you know, the few years that I've been going. So it's worth oh, it. Course. Well, for those who do not know what ACHE is, it's a, the American Council of Hypnotherapy Examiners. It is the embody the the, what do we call it? The embodied the organization that accredits, accredits uh, other hypnotherapists and we have conferences for education and everything. But today we're going to be talking more about hypnosis, the benefits of hypnosis. As you all know, um, Lisa Mubari, I am located right here in Los Angeles area, clinical hypnotherapy for you. And the name of my business is Heal Within. Um, let us take our audience from A to Z. I know we're going to go into the depth of the root of hypnosis, but hypnosis for so many is like a lala. It's the unknown. It's the scary thing. Uh, let's talk about how the mind our conscious, our subconscious, and that's one of the reasons, that's one of the ways I explain hypnosis. It's like, it's not the conscious level, but tapping into the subconscious. How do you share and educate your students? Well, I, I think the, the most important thing about any session anyway, whenever you begin a session with your clients is to educate them. Without yeah. educating them, you haven't really got a session. You're, you're really the facilitator. Um, of their of their process and you know it's very you know there's one thing to help them on their way it's not about giving advice to somebody it's about helping them to find what's within and that you find what's within through your own subconscious hypnosis is for me probably the best and only tool you can really uh, find what's going on in the subconscious and I've done many modalities of different sorts and whether they come under different names, different guises, essentially the good ones are all based with hypnotic state. And that state is a state which bypasses the critical factor, um, the critical mind for those that don't know about hypnosis. Um, and you then are able to move into that part of the mind that has sometimes suppressed or uncharted territory that you haven't quite um, figured on. I mean, it's fascinating when you get a client who knows what they know they know they've been to therapy they've done years of work and they have plenty of information and there might be that tiny little tidbit that's lingering in the subconscious mind which explodes it out of all proportion and just says that's why you've got the issue and they have the information that sometimes they can't always remember it they can't find what it is and the subconscious in my from my experience, has always brought up what is needed at that time. It never, ever, uh, you know, it's, it's not a question of it doesn't lie. 
that's that's a whole different thing subconscious is full of misunderstandings and misperceptions that's fine as long as those misperceptions are brought to the surface and only then can one actually find a way through it to sort of say is that is that your truth now and do you wish to change that truth because it might not actually belong to you that could have been your parents it could have been your families friends brothers sisters etc etc we hold on to so much information that has been downloaded to yes, us yes. and it's not ours yes um so what i like to call it it's a perception how about we just change or shift your perception since we cannot delete anything from the subconscious mind Absolutely. Absolutely. And one of the things that, uh, and I think you, you're really keen on this as well, is, is understanding if you work, if you live your life from your intuition, that is not a downloaded piece of information. That is not something that has had any information prior to your experience. Mm. Uh, and and it, the information that you get on, on, uh, on true intuition, not thought. You'll know when you're in the difference between thought and intuition, there is a difference. And I help my clients to find out how to, to reconcile with that. But when you run from your intuition, you really do get a different um, perspective without background, without noise. The problem is a lot of people don't understand the difference between what happens when thought comes in on intuition and most importantly, intuition does not always guide you to the easiest route. <laughs> so people often get very upset. Well, I followed my intuition and now I'm in this experience. Well, that's because you need that experience. Um, it's the next stage. It's a growth. It's a growth place. Um, so people often get disappointed. They don't want to necessarily follow their intuition because it seems like it might be the harder, the harder path. Correct. Well, I got into hypnotherapy over 20 years ago. I, I, I share this story with so many of my clients and have shared it online that I, many years before I got to go to school and study with Gil Boyne, that I healed myself, my ovarian cyst, and instead mm -hmm. of needing surgery, it was through hypnotherapy that I healed it that I no longer needed the third surgery that I was going to have. Thus, one night sitting in my den and I was crying and everything, I opened a yellow book at that time. The telephone book was a yellow pages. And I opened that and it said hypnosis. And I opened and I called that number of curiosity, six o'clock on Friday night, Gil Boyne answered his phone. And next thing I know is, he says, come in tomorrow. If you have healed yourself and you believe hypnosis work, why don't you come and learn so you can teach others? I was an assistant to attorney. There was no way this was going to be my, and you know, Gil, you walk in, he's got you. And that's exactly what happened Saturday morning, 930 class started and I was in class and never looked back. My life changed. So what brought you to hypnosis and hypnotherapy to this world? So I, I went through it a very different route. I had no clue about hypnosis. I mean, even after I finished training with John Butler, I was still like, what is this? I mean, I, was, I hadn't come from a place where I'd understood anything about it other than I think, I mean, I had a good friend of mine over in Hawaii, Dr. Uh, Paul Carter, who is a, a trained Ericksonian trained hypnotherapist. Oh and Virginia Satir. I mean, he, he's a wonderful hypnotist, actually works a lot in the dental arena in Germany. Um, but he was doing a lot of uh, um, self-development groups, and I had been on other self-development groups. And so I kind of had a sort of inkling of it, but still no knowledge of it. I kept doing self-development groups, which were great fun. But after about a week or 10 days of, of leaving them, I'd be the same person. It, nothing would really stick. I'd have a change. I'd have an, you know, wonderful um, eureka moments. And then I was like, okay, well, I want to develop and grow and I want a lasting effect. Why doesn't that work? And I was coming to a point in my life where I wanted to change my career. And I did 
what I now understand to be automatic writing. I wrote a list of everything I wanted to do in life. And that included chef in space, a potter, um, a cook, uh, you know, I wanted to be a master cook. I, I was already an animator. I wanted to be an animator, but 3D and, and all these things, nothing special. But in that list, it said hypnotherapist. And I have no clue oh. to this day why. Um, my uh, flatmate at the time says, oh, you've been watching too much Darren Brown. Darren Brown is a wonderful uh, English, uh, me- he does uh, mentalism as well mentalism. as hypnosis. Uh, as well as hypnosis. And I thought, well, maybe I have, but what I was doing, I sat, it was the beginnings of the internet and I kept looking at who trained the trainers. And I was going to who trained, and I kind of looked at this pyramid effect and found Gil Boyne. I phoned up this chap and, and he says, hello dear, I'm 82 years old. And he said, I don't do this anymore. And I said, oh, and he said, look, why don't you speak to Dr. Butler? He knows my work better than I do. Mm. And what a encouraging thing to, for a tutor to say about his own student. Yes. So immediately I phoned up John. We got on very well. It was one of his early trainings. There were very few people. Now it's uh, really difficult to get into his training. Yes. Um, but he, he, I was very blessed. And also he had the time to, to give us. Um, we really did have a lot of time and he had a lot of time for all of us. And um, at that particular time, he was doing a program called Hypno 5 Live. And Hypno 5 Live was a surgery of a guy um, having a hernia operation done with no anesthetic. This had never been done live on TV before. And Gil yes. Boyne was, uh, sorry, John Butler was doing this. So we were learning at the exact time he was doing this program. So the chap who was going to be the uh, client came into class and we chatted to him. And so we, we had some idea of where this can go. What, what this can do for somebody. It, it was really a, a, a very real experience then. Isn't this the one that was also telecasted live with news and everything in the UK? Um, I'm not sure. I, it was definitely, it was a live show. Um, right. Even, even um, Charles Montagu was on it and he's a wonderful hypnotist from, right. from the UK. Yes, he's a lovely chap. So he was on that program. They were showing, I mean, it was an entire, it was a proper, I think, hour long yeah. program with electrodes on his head. And, you know, it was the works. They probably did put it out live. At yes. that particular time, I had a good friend who was a surgeon and he had invited me to meet some surgeon friends of his. And he said, and they all came up to me, did you see that program? Can you teach us? And I'd only just learned with John Butler. And I said, well, I don't think I should. I'm not that good yet. I hadn't even had a client. I said, but I know a man who can. And so I asked John if he would teach the surgeons at Barnet General Hospital in, in England, in London. Mm. And uh, he came, he took me with him and, you know, because it was my friends. And um, we, from that place, set up the Institute of Medical and Dental Hypnotherapy. And that's more or less how I got into the medical and dental side of hypnosis. Beautiful. Um, yeah, and it really is a passion of mine. I work with children, um, adults, and now animals. <laughs> yes, um, and you made headlines in the news and everything. I do hip. Uh, I use hypnosis for pain management. I, I do self hypnosis for root canals. I have not had any anesthesia in my body for the longest time. And I've had so many children that I have worked for them mm. because it's a fear base and what we imagine. And so let us explain how hypnosis can bypass uh, the fear factor, how we can, uh, it, if we can do the ABC of how it not only bypasses the critical factor, but managing the pain, managing the perception of what pain is, and so that our audience, the ABC of it, understand before we go into nowadays, we can do knee surgery, hip replacement, C-section, and not in America because of insurance, I think. But uh, so let us take that route. Would you mind? I, do think, I actually do think there was a C-section done in the States um, in the 1960s, I think. 
right but that was just <laughs> a long ago not... yeah <laughs> all right um so so let's let's go back to roots you say abc yeah. and i i said to you let's go back to the roots because the root. it's not only the roots with the dental but roots as in where this began hypnosis originally um kind of took off if you if you know what i mean from around the 1650s with um, with the understanding of you can go into a trance state and the use of that trance state ended up being specifically for medical and dental issues. Um, they, they were testing and trialing, I mean, sort of from 1650s, um, it was just understood there's a trance state. And then in the 1750s, when Mesmer came along, he really understood it to be a potential um, medical a healing tool right. and and that's what he started mesmerism. to use it mesmerism and that's what he started to use it for and once you understand that hypnosis was really that tool and until chemical anesthesia came in hypnosis was the go-to plan i mean there wasn't any other source and of course more people died from chemical anesthesia at the time than they did with hypnosis but yet obviously chemical anesthesia seemed to be an easier way of uh of getting that person into a, a, a zone that the, that the surgeons wanted. Right. Um, I also realized that at that point, most hypnotists at that stage probably weren't that proficient in getting their subjects into a hypnotic state, keeping them there. And they weren't totally understanding the psychology of, of that process. Um, Pavlov did most of the work in terms of the experimentation using animals and then started to realize, ah, there's a, there's a, it, he was more interested in the physiology of it, but then he did realize that there was a component that had a psychological opponent and then he component, and then he started to recognize that. And of course, at that time, we've got Freud coming in and, and, and more of the psychotherapy areas. So then it became this blend of what we can do and eventually starts to take from the medical dental side of things into the psychotherapy side of things. Um, but ultimately, um, hypnotherapy, hypnosis was a tool for uh, medical and dental issues. Now, I can also share with my guests that how we take someone into that state of the trance state. And because a lot of people have this misconception that once I get hypnotized, you take control. Whereas I share with my clients, you are more in control in hypnosis, more in control of every nerve, every muscle, every organ, every mm -hmm. tissue, every cell to a point that that's where we bypass the pain. We bypass everything and we can control the same way as I can control this section, not to feel anything, either mm -hmm. the drill or the, uh, no, no matter what. But if you were to explain how you take the clients to a point of having surgery nowadays, the dental industry and the medical industry, and then we talk about the beautiful doggy. So Lisa, you know, it's funny, both, both of us have been trained by Gil Boyne. And guess what? I do the same thing. <laughs> So, you know, it's interesting. Everybody has their ways of, of connecting their patients. And I think, I, as you well know, it is pa patient by patient um, experience, especially when you're working with little ones. You have to go through a whole different uh, um, kind of connection to, you know, what how to change. I mean, I'm working with a six year old um, that's never been hypnotized doesn't, and, and needs to have a lot of tooth work done. Mm. And, you know, the way that I work, if I say it's going to help every cell, it's not going to work. But when I say that to an adult, yeah, it does, it works completely. So every, you know, it's, you have to go person to person always, as you know, um, yet, I mean, I, I tend to say when you're going into surgery of any kind, you're going in for healing. They're not, you're not going in to be hurt. You're going in, you're already in pain. You've already got a problem. The pain was an indicator that there was a problem. Now you're going there to heal. So, so there's, there's no real reason why you should be in pain 
because you're in healing process. Now that doesn't mean having your body cut open. It, you know, some of my clients, of course, do use anesthesia and we use um, anesthesia plus hypnosis or sedation and hypnosis as combinations. Right. Um, there is always a level of discomfort in the body. It's being cut open. It's going to not agree to that at some point. Using hypnosis, there is a tendency of agreement within the subconscious. And that makes the body go, oh, I'm doing this because I'm healing. And it goes so deep into the core of you that your body knows exactly how to respond and what to do and how to do it. And the body wants that because it's been in pain. It no longer wants that situation. Of course, there's the, the other experience that people have where, where I've worked with people with amputation. And, and many of those people have got more pain after the amputation from phantom uh, pain syndrome. And again, it's exactly the same thing. It's coming back to the subconscious, that inner part that you don't consciously think about, the part that helps you blink, breathe and swallow. And having an, an internal agreement on that level that this is safe now. This was the right thing to do. This was a healing process. And so from that point, you're always teaching the person the, the, the healing part of it, not the pain part of it. But exactly. it, it, it's, it's, you know, it's funny you saying every, every muscle, every bone, every ligament, every fire. I mean, that's exactly, you know, what I would say um, to my client is it's very important. And of course, always talk about comfort never talk about pain Ex that's that's exactly what i was going to say because when i speak of um hypnosis it's usually for pre and post that how you can heal faster and more with ease especially even with cancer patients when they are going through the nausea and everything this can ease their nausea this can ease their pain and the emotional aspect as much as the physical part yeah absolutely and we do, and as a hypnotherapist we have to be so careful not to put ourselves in a place where it seems unrealistic to each person each person has their own idea of what of where they want to go and how they believe that where they believe they can get to and you can only go as far as their own limited mind if mm. you go you can go further we can all go further i mean i'm sure i could go further but i have my own limitations at some point so it's a question of of saying can i push my limitations can i take it that little little bit further and um with kids that's really important um often they've been told that they will have pain or they will have some type of experience they've been told what type of experience they'll be receiving and then you sort of say well what if that person doesn't know that you don't have it beautiful so what, what what if they're not sure about you because you're different and can you you know what if you could change their knowledge can you do that can you show them something else because there might be another kid after you who would also be the same as you, but is told not. And so could you change that for the, that person to give a new talk to somebody else? And they're like, oh yeah, you know, I want to do that. Of course you do. That's why I get a lot of- Empowered. Empowered. I mean, this is why I get a lot of kids who are willing to come on my, uh, on my YouTube channel because they have felt that they've been in charge of their bodies and they've sh shown the adult who's helped them something new and they have. I mean, more often than not, they have shown the medical or dental profession professional that they have uh, something to share and something to give. And it's very exciting for them. That's interesting the way you uh, to segue and to reiterate what you said. I had a seven year old kid who came here and his entire thing was not Superman, but being a cowboy. And he would walk in here with a hat. <laughs> and I told him, I said, but where are your chaps? Believe it or not. He, when I told him, where are your chaps? He says, well, what are chaps? And when I explained to him, he could imagine himself putting his chaps on and walking down the street with his hat. Yeah, with his stride. <laughs> his stride and everything. The week after he walked in here with chaps on and he said, 
now I am, I am a full cowboy. And I said, and the cowboys, you know, the, it was a whole story. He embodied that thing. As adults, we forget how to imagine as beautifully as children and how to utilize that imagination to be the success that we want to be. Absolutely. I mean, there's often in with adults, uh, I see a lot of my the therapists that I help with uh, supervision, they they lean too much towards positive thinking. And then the adults that they're working with can't positive think. And I'm like, no, 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 nobody can positive think. You have to positive feel. And the feeling is the imagination. The feeling gets you back. And this is where I come to limitations. You uh, you're only limited by the feelings that you have. So you want to go beyond that feeling and say, well, what if I felt like this? And what if I felt like I could walk? What if I felt like I could move without pain? What would that feeling be? So it's very important to have some concept. But again, I'm very, I, I'm, I'm, I am a realist. I'm married to a scientist. So I do, I do keep well, it very- Hypnosis <laughs> is science. Oh, it definitely is. He wouldn't have married me if I wasn't in the science <laughs> field. <laughs> um, so it, it really, and there is a lot of science to this. It's fascinating. I mean, we've got some, I, I, I love the fact that there are so many research Churches that are, you know, when, when we talk about science, we, we're not looking for the, uh, is this right or is this wrong? We're looking to study. We're looking to find out about the subject. And with hypnosis, every time someone does research, we find out we're right. You know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a fascinating thing. It's every single time a researcher, it's, there isn't a wrong to the subconscious. And that's what I love. Um, and there's no wrong to your healing process, whatever, wherever you get to in your healing process, there is no wrong to it. Um, I myself had a huge um, experience with back, with back surgery. And I went through a period of time, I had to lie down for 11 months. And after two spine surgeries, so I'd already gone through two horrific surgeries and then ended up back in the hospital again. And one of the things that I said to myself every single day, if this is as good as it gets, I'm okay with it. Now, I know I wasn't really okay. You know, you always have the conflicting thought. I couldn't walk. But at the end of the day, I thought, well, I have to be okay with the fact that I'm still lying down and I can't get up. Mm. And I would do this every single day. Well, if this, and there'll be some moments where I didn't feel the, the, cause I didn't have any use of my, the legs, uh, the use of my legs had gone. So I didn't have any sensation down my legs. And I thought, well, but there would be horrible sensations, not, not physical. It was like, um, you know, these aches and pains all the time. And I was like, well, if that's okay, I'll go with that. That that's, I, that's better than yesterday. And so the next day it would happen again. I went, well, if this is as good as I'm good with this way, you know, and every single day, it became a process of going, well, I'm okay with this. I'm okay with this. And I, every day had to be a surrender to I'm okay with this. At the same time, knowing that there's conflict, knowing that the conscious mind always conflicts the subconscious, and then saying, but I can move through that. I can use my tool to go beyond that conflict and know what the conflict means. So it's, it's you know, there is a lot of play with it. I mean, even having, I've had my own wisdom teeth uh, removed, no anesthetic. Even in the midst of that process, my brain went, oh, this could hurt. You know, <laughs> it's like, that's, that's what the brain does. And it's, it's not a bad, it's not to be feared, as you mentioned before. When the mind goes into conflict, that's not to be feared. That's to be moved through. Exactly. And, once, and once that's gone through, oh, yes, so this could really hurt. Yeah, and don't, don't need to go there. I can go somewhere else now. Exactly. And so as soon as that happens, you're on the next, you're on the next. And... And that comes with, uh, I was uh, sharing it with one of my clients who came in here with a panic and anxiety. And when he said, I've heard that hypnosis can do magic, it can. And yet it's not always like a magical thing that it, it, it fades everything away. Yeah, it is it a process and it is a co uh, collaboration with mm -hmm. your mind and body and stepping into what you want, not what you don't want. Yes. And, and I always say to people, be real, realistic. Those yeah. areas of the mind will always come up. They'll come up and they'll go and they'll come and they go. And eventually they get bored. And the new way of being is just there. <laughs> That's I mean, him. <laughs> there, there, there's so many, there, you know, 
there are so many things that we have experienced in our life that have dissolved. We no longer have a clue where they came from. They just don't exist. Let's, let's segue to another area. I used to be phobic of dogs, hugely phobic of dogs. If you ask really? me, oh, I mean, honestly, I was one of the worst. I wouldn't go to people's homes. If they had a dog, you couldn't get me to knock on a door. Um, if there was oh, a dog, wow. oh my goodness. I was, I was really, I would almost avoid holidays. If, if I had to go away, I would really rethink the whole thing. If there was mm -hmm. wandering dogs in the streets as some countries have and it was, it was a big no-no. And this was right up to the age of about, I'd say, um, must have been about 21, 22. So it was not, not to adulthood. Oh, I was in adulthood and I was not okay with dogs. Could you have asked me where this idea came from? No, there, my brother was perfectly fine with dogs. So it wasn't something in the family. Um, there was no trauma. I'd never been bitten. I'd never had what I, you know, my mother said, oh, when a dog jumped up and looked at you at a pram, but you know, <laughs> you know, there's plenty of things that can happen. That's not a trauma right. moment. So, so, you know, there was no reason. And as you know, um, most recently, I've, I've used hypnosis for a dog for a hernia operation. And funnily enough, during that experience, while I was working very close to an animal, I didn't know. I didn't even know this creature. You know, it's not somebody I, oh, I know such and such is pet. I had no clue who this dog was. But there is no nature. attachment. Then zero. I mean, I just literally walked in and said, okay, I'm going to do this operation. And I remember partway through that, my own feeling is like oh, I used to have a phobia and it was this kind of almost a, 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 a who was that girl that had a phobia so once things have gone it more often they are really gone and not only are they gone in one way you go the opposite way you know for me it's like I love dogs now I, I got over my phobia I have to say not with hypnosis per se or as, as I understood it I didn't use any therapy I actually got a dog <laughs> It was, it was incredible. I mean, it was somebody gave me a dog and um, I, I couldn't touch it. I couldn't go near it. It was bundled up in a huge pile of towels and it was, it was smaller than the palm of my hand. And I tipped it into the bath and I'm looking at it and spraying it with a shower and I couldn't go near it. And then at one, then suddenly at this moment, I looked at this creature all bedraggled and wet and I thought, what am I doing? And it just disappeared. It just, it, it was exposure and it just went, I, this is my, this is part of me, my stuff. And instant. That went, instant. So it's, it's a fascinating thing. You know, once you get over something, you can absolutely drop it, but it doesn't, it, you can remember that you had it. <laughs> well, I think just like anything else is like someone who becomes a non-smoker, they do remember and I do share this and I say you were not born as a smoker so you picked up smoking thus you can also let it go and become a non-smoker and live your life smoke-free and with harmony yeah and it's like I can and I'm going yeah yeah you did this <laughs> you did this so things do not happen to us they happen for us by us and all that education and empowering our clients, I think the same thing with insomnia and everything else. So share with us about the dog, how it came and how did the dog, how can a dog understand words that as a hypnotherapist, we literally use a lot of words and suggestions to help a client tap into their subconscious mind or go into hypnosis. So other than our tonality makes a big difference. Well, as you know, and many of the people watching this, most important thing about being a therapist is rapport. Mm. And creating a rapport instantly with anyone, anything, uh, <laughs> any being, it's, it, you just, you know, that much of it is about silence. And just being there, I think, um, and your energy. So for people who don't know what this dog thing is about, I'll, I'll just quickly, <laughs> quickly just recap for people. Um, I, 
I had the opportunity of using hypnosis on at a veterinary school in Selchuk University. Um, I wouldn't go around recommending doing this to all animals at this point. Um, at Purdue, I'm going to hopefully do some research here uh, at the veterinary school to make sure that this is something that can be done. However, um, Dr. Volges Volieski in Hungary, I believe it was in way back in the 1900s, actually used a lot of hypnosis on animals. And, um, but again, like Pavlov, the hypnosis on animals wasn't necessarily for the animals. It was animal exper experimentation for mm -hmm. the understanding of how we use it and implement it in humans. However, it did ha I did realize that, well, this is no different. Uh, you know, our subconscious is, is a part of our being that tries to keep us safe. Misunderstandings or no misunderstandings, it, its ultimate goal is to keep us healed and well. So the subconscious mind rules your autonomic nervous system, your blinking, your breathing, your heart rate, your saliva, your tears, your sweat. Well, every animal, human or other, has a subconscious. And this is why this is where I work with special needs people, and this is the way I can work with children and elderly and some people who have Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, because they still have a subconscious that is trying to keep them safe. Mm. Now, when you go into a surgical experience, you you do surrender yourself. Um, you've you've resigned yourself to that experience. Now, fascinating with the animal, it did exactly the same. Um, it was already, you know, it was nervous. I could tell it had a, a you know, a lot of um, sweat was pouring from the mouth and everything. So I just stood there. I wasn't in scrubs. So maybe that helped as well because the smell of my clothes felt more outside. Um, but I just gave him a cuddle and of course, just let him lie down and hummed a lot. I used tonality a lot and mon monotony, which is what we use in uh, hypnosis with voice. Um, and I did talk to the animal, even though he was Turkish. Um, I thought, well, you know, language knows no bounds. And, and so exactly. I, I continued just to use a monotonous voice and tone and made sure that the veterinary students, because there was about 20, maybe even 30 of us in this room. I mean, everybody was fascinating. The room was piled full of people. Yeah. Um, we had the um, anesthetist on hand and she wanted to keep watching the signs. We did all the checks um, that she would normally do to see if a, uh, the animal was in an anesthetic um, a position and the dog showed identical reflexes exactly mm -hmm. the same and interesting these are exactly we did the drop test so i would do that yep. yeah i would do the drop test uh, with uh, any human being because you want to see how floppy they are they did a pinch test with clamps i also would do that if i was doing teaching somebody about pain control and so they did a pinch test in between the the uh, paws Pause. they pinch and they pinched that quite hard and they snapped it out and they're like, he's not making any movement. I'm like, he's ready. So there was some point, I mean, we, I did, and I did ask them to put a, a ribbon around the, the muzzle because again, I didn't know this dog, you know, he's not asleep. He could right. easily just get up, bite my nose while I'm trying to do something. If you, I don't know how he's going to respond. That's why and we you were close to more. his uh, face, correct? I was extremely close to him. Right. I was right. And again, I do that with all my patients. Exactly. Sitting next to them. Yes. Although COVID has given me an opportunity to, to work with people thousands of miles away on, on WhatsApp. And I still feel close to them. I put the, make sure they're in the ears and we'll still do surgeries. Um, and they feel like I'm there and I'll be watching them. So, you know, it, it, the, the animal res responded in identical ways of a human identical uh, fascinating experience and immediately when when we finished the operation you know I said to the the vets well he can have a drink now and they looked at me suddenly like we don't give dogs drink for five hours and then I went oh yes he hasn't had anesthetic of course the dog was back with its owner within half an hour because that's how long yeah. it took the animal the dog owner to come so usually the dog owners need to wait about five hours before um they can retrieve their pets if they're if they're in a decent state well at any anesthesia for any surgery there is yes. a whole process of recovery and everything Absolutely. and i think that's one of the things about dentistry that when i was having my root canal 
and uh, when he drilled and he wanted to do the air, I felt it and I, he said, but I already took the nerve and I said, apparently not. So he went in and there was a dash left in there. So being so aware, yes. it becomes so acute that that's the beauty of the work that we do. And here, that is a beautiful story, Sharon. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Thank you to everybody kudos, for listening. <laughs> kudos to you. I'm sure so many of our listeners are going to think, well, not everyone can be hypnotized. And as hypnotherapists, we, I do share with my clients and I say, it's a consent. Hypnosis yes. is a consent. Not If you choose not to, there is no way anyone can force you into hypnosis. Absolutely. Share your view, your version. So, so it's a really interesting thing because as I mentioned just uh, briefly, you know, I've worked with people with special needs and Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and people who are really in, in some ways um, not entirely consenting, you know, not entirely able to. There is some moment that you absolutely get that rapport, that one moment where I remember my, the first time I worked with a woman who had severe Alzheimer's, she was in a home, it was, it was a very tragic situation. Um, it wasn't, it, what had happened was her hip, her, she had a fall, her hip mm -hmm. had been broken, she had a new hip replacement, however, was not getting up to walk. She, she hadn't stood up. Her husband, all he wanted to do was take her for a drive. He wanted to be able to get her in from the home into the car and take her for a drive. So I remember she was sitting down uh, on a you know small chair and I came into her and I, I kneeled next to her and I just looked up into her eyes and I said, do you trust me? And you could see this little light bulb going on for a mm. moment. I said, we're going for a walk. And I took her for an imaginary walk in, you know, I asked him a little bit about her. She was, you know, her, her era was sort of the forties and things like that. So I said, let's, I kind of imagined myself going into the 1940s and yeah. how would it have been and rose gardens and England at that time, obviously not wartime, you know, something right. beautiful. And she, I said, would you like to stand? Now I did know that of course she hadn't stood for a long time and it was gonna be difficult. So we had people on hand that would help manage her getting up. Right. Um, and she, that's, she made the efforts to say, right, this is it. But I then had the understanding, it suddenly occurred to me, why would she not walk? Mm. Why would she choose not to walk? What was her subconscious keeping her safe for? And of course, the realization to me was, if not she can walk, she can walk out of here. It's not safe. Beautiful. And so I understood her subconscious was absolutely keeping her safe by not walking. Yes. So you've got to weigh up what's really going on for a person and how, what, the, what the subconscious is actually trying to say to you. And so when I recognize that, even though she did attempt to get up and, and I said to the husband, use, I create an MP3, use this often, just so she might have the desire if that's mm -hmm. what she wants. But I said to him, it's, it's possible that that desire is being suppressed for good reason. And to help him then afterwards to make him understand what the subconscious was doing, that was more important. And when he saw it, it was like, ah, okay. So I don't need to keep pushing her. So, you know, there's, you know, it, some there is a consent there there is always a consent but it doesn't have to look like i'm okay with this right uh, correct i mean yeah yes. it doesn't it doesn't have to be oh um i even internalize the idea of consent it really is a rapport consent in many cases that's really what even um stage hypnotists or street hypnotists do of course from the moment we say i want to come up on stage yeah it's a consent. <laughs> I think from the initial phone call uh, of inquiry and asking for the treatment and wanting a consultation, they are opening and consenting, wanting their change. It's not about what we do, but mm. they are willing to get better. Yes, and there's that. That's what ha the the areas that then you tend to have a little bit of an issue with is with children. Because 
mum or dad has made the call and they are like, well, what do I want to be doing this for? And then it comes right back to the, con- the beginning of our conversation, Lisa, which is all about training the person that you have in the room. You're, you're not telling them, I'm going to change you or you have to change. You're then giving, especially with kids, you're giving them a tool for life and saying, this is an option. Do you want it? And say, this is how the brain works. I teach the kids exactly the same way as I teach the adults. And I tell them that. And I say to them, I'm going to teach you about neurology. Do you know what neurology is? And they're looking at mom and or they're looking at dad. And I'm like, yeah, you do. Don't worry. It's something you're going to learn with me now. It's like stars. And then we talk about stars. I talk about light switches and how the electrical current works. Yes. Um, obviously, that helps being an electrician's daughter. So, <laughs> so I always bring You know that where in. the current is, where the switch is, when you can turn it on and you can turn it off. <laughs> That's exactly how. That's but, what you're but- doing. But it's creating stories that they can become involved with and making that shift from within. I mean, that's exactly what uh, Dr. Bruce Limpton and Joe Dispenza have been doing is teaching the consciousness and the subconscious. That, so it's, it's beautiful work. What we do is beautiful. Ah, okay. Something happened, or Sharon is frozen. It's okay. So um, I don't know what happened. Seems like Sharon went into a trance state of, so I will continue. And hopefully she will be right back. Technology, right? For those of you who are still, there you go. She's back. Internet connection. She's back. (laughs) <laughs> now we can't hear you it's okay it's right down here okay so for all of you who are present i thank you i think there she comes that's back. it and back. that's it you are here you are back. thank you sorry everybody i think something in you know this is a, non- a non-working college right now university <laughs> Well, we are becoming professors in something in life. And um, well, it's already okay. past our it's one hour. Past. Okay. Or I cannot see for the life of me when I do this Zoom Facebook, I still have not figured out, I have not mastered to see if the messages and what everyone is asking and everything, but we will respond. Sharon, in case somebody wants to contact you, would you please share your information if they have any questions, if they want to contact you, how will they contact you? Please do. I'm, I'm, I really enjoy having questions. Um, so my, my email is Sharon at mindbeing.com, mindandbeing.com. Uh, um, you can also contact Lisa is a friend of mine. It's uh, under Sharon Waxkirsch. Um, and so, and I also encourage people, uh, you could welcome to click into uh, my Facebook and I've got um, Facebook pages under Sharon Waxkirsch, hypnotherapy and dental hypnosis. Um, but it, you know, you can get in touch with me all sorts of different ways like that. But do, I do encourage people if they're interested in what I do is go on my YouTube channel and under Sharon Waxkirsch. Fortune is only one in the world. So it's not hard to find me. <laughs> Yes, we are unique. Very unique. And so um, easy to find. That's all I can say. So have a look at, um, the, you know, if you want more, you know, have more questions. Don't leave any questions on the, on the YouTube because I tend not to answer them from there. But, but uh, you're welcome to connect to me in, on Facebook. This has been absolutely amazing. In closing, What is one suggestion, one thing you can share for our audience that will empower them and help them to welcome this modality into their healing world? Wow, one thing, goodness. (laughs) In my my book, it has to be follow your intuition. 
follow your intuition, trust yourself, trust and trust your own inner guide. Um, that is always going to be your self empowerment. As I said before, it doesn't come with any previous knowledge, ideas, or lineage of where of somebody else. It's uniquely yours, and you will run from there on a on a wonderful trajectory. Even if it's tough, it still belongs to you. Beautiful. One question came to mind. Complete the sentence. Sharon is. Unique. You are. As I you are beautiful. It is the same for everyone. I mean, it's so important, you know, that the, you, the, these sayings of, um, you know, don't, don't tread in their shoes, you've got your own, and these kind of sayings, but it's so true. And most of people's issues come from trying to be somebody they're not, mm. trying to live a life that doesn't belong to them and trying to do it differently in a way that perhaps doesn't follow their real path. And it's always come back to your path. It, it will shout at you, it will scream at you. And then eventually it dies down because you're not listening. But if you really want to, and then you'll kind of live 20, 30 years not doing your thing. And then suddenly it will kind of go, you know, you really should have been a hypnotist. And then, <laughs> and then it will go, all right, all right, I'll, I'll have a go, you know. And I would recommend highly for anyone who wants to uh, follow and pursue this modality, this way of healing, this education, please uh, make sure it's more than a weekend because this is a science. Yes. It is as much as an art as it is a science and it's not a weekend course. So, <laughs> yes, I agree. I, I just, you know, I'm, I'm doing my new course. It's coming out actually on the 21st and it's of, gonna, this month. of this month, the 21st of July. It, it, to qualify as a hypnotherapist, it's minimum of 200 hours. Exactly. Um, and we will follow, you know, I will be sharing not only my videos, but how they work and what's been going on in them and what the downfalls are. It's very important, you know, the, the, the areas that don't work as much as the areas that do. I don't want people to have to go to make the same mistakes as I've done. So, um, yeah, so I'm bringing all that in. And those that are already hypnotherapists come along for the same course as an even cheaper price to to just, you know, look back refresh. and refresh your mind. And again, I'm doing it as supervision and I'm bringing people in and I want um, our lovely Lisa to be one of the people who comes in um, to share her knowledge. I mean, her knowledge is phenomenal on women's issues. And, you know, again, it's a hugely, it's a hugely untapped market. Um, you know, as I always say, focusing on, on maybe one or two areas in hypnotherapy is really important. Becoming an expert in that is very important. It is. And with that, I want to thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your husband to allow you <laughs> to see the computer. And I look forward to our next venture in life. Hopefully, yes. we will open the school sometime yes. next year. And by all means, I thank your wisdom, your knowledge, and being here and sharing this information with our audience. Well, thank Until you. Until we meet again. Yes. God's blessings be with you and thank all you. our audience. God bless you and may the universal light surround you. Until next week, goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you for being here. If you want to check out some of the testimonials that I've got, click right here. But if you want to go back and watch other videos from a week ago, two weeks ago, even a year ago, click right here. See you next time.